ಸಾಕು ಈ ಒಂದು ಕೊನೆ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಗೆ ಟೈಮ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಸೇರ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದಕ್ಕೆ ನಮ್ಗೆಲ್ಲ ತಿಳ್ದಂಗೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮ ನಗರಗಳ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಯಾವ ತರ ತೊಂದರೆ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಅಂತ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಗೊತ್ತು ಸೊ ಇದು ಒಂದು ಕೊನೆ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಎವ್ರಿಬಾಡಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡಿಂಗ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಸೊ ಆಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ ನೋ ಸಿಟೀಸ್ ಟುಡೆ ಆರ್ ಚಾಲೆಂಜ್ಡ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಇನ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ ಫ್ರಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಗ್ಲೋಬಲ್ ಎಫರ್ಟ್ ಟು ಮಿಟಿಗೇಟ್ ಇಂಪ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಕ್ಲೈಮೇಟ್ ಚೇಂಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ರೆಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಎಮಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಬಿಲ್ಡ್ ರೆಸಿಲಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಟೇಕನ್ ದಟ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಫಾರ್ವರ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಕಮಿಟಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಗೇರ್ ಅಪ್ ಟು ದೀಸ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ by agreeing um, with the paris climate change accord and uh, this was at the beginning of this year and but what happened was as the covid second wave hit the city like many other cities and towns and villages across india um you know all of us got swept away from the focus of what we were doing and half the year has now gone by and we are at a crucial uh, point of time to see where we are what are the fundamental plans we need to put in place what should local authorities agencies institutions and others need to do to address this commitment and what kind of comprehensive and coordinated action is essential for a city to truly act and transform its housing mobility open space energy water infrastructure biodiversity and more uh, accompanied by regulation and monitoring despite the pandemic in an effort to keep the conversation going esg has uh, put in a long drawn effort over 10 weeks uh, which unfortunately got uh, stopped due to the fact that many of us fell sick with covid in the second wave and this has been a very nasty year as we lost many of our near and dear ones we also lost our trusty dr shirdi prasad tekur and everything that we were doing almost came to a grinding halt uh, we did not even have time to grieve or pay tribute as our days with were filled with struggles trying to uh, find beds medicines oxygen ambulances and more and uh, writing a condolence message uh, became so common um, like on a whatsapp or any other uh, social media uh, we also how condolence messages kept uh, flowing in our uh, facebook pages and various other social media so looking back it's really hard to imagine that we even survived the last few weeks uh, the last month in particular but as we are all now trying to recover and while the healing has been extremely draining we are slowly picking up picking up things from where we left them and so and so now getting back to our conversations um and trying to advance this effort which we started on the city's climate action plan uh, which has been on top of the team's agenda the series began on the international water day on march 22nd 2021 and we are at the end of june 2021 it was a very interesting journey listening to voices from a very diverse section of our society over nine webinars the team discussed and debated uh, what it takes for bangalore to become a, a climate friendly uh, metropolis uh, this is just a very small step uh, and today we have consolidated all of those voices who participated in this uh, series and uh, given the challenging challenging situation that we were in um, <clears throat> it, it the it did not give us an opportunity to go outside engage with uh, local community people go across the city try and understand what uh, people are facing in the context of climate change or even trying to understand how many of them can even grapple with um, what is going to come So like I said this is a very small step um and uh, we apologize for the many drawbacks uh, there are in this effort <clears throat> but we sincerely hope to take these discussions debates ideas and thoughts across the city and in Canada to ensure no voice is left unheard for today we hope to share with 
all of you some of the highlights from the series and also hear from our speaker mr prem chanda varkar who will uh, give a overview and also Uh, comment and uh, give his feedback and his own ideas on this entire process uh, and suggestions for such an effort and following that we would love to hear from mrs vandita sharma about the process that would uh, that the government would be taking up um, to implement this and we all hope that public participation and involvement in this effort will be key to particularly strength in governance at every ward and the planning for uh, such a climate change uh, agreement should start at the ward level is what we all feel we are very sorry that our third speaker dr janaki nayar uh, without who today's conversation will remain incomplete uh, but she is unable to join us as she is unwell uh, we wish her a very speedy recovery and we hope we will be able to bring her to this dialogue on bengaluru's climate action sooner or later uh, and after our uh, speakers share our thoughts the session will be open to some of the participants and the speakers who were key in this process uh, we would love you to uh, participate engage uh, in this process as well uh, you can either um, key in your comments or questions in the chat box or suggestions in the chat box or you can raise your hand and we will take it up so before we move on uh, i will request leo saldana to introduce uh, mr prem chandavarkar and vandita sharma and we will commence with a brief overview by my colleague malavika uh who will give a recap of the sessions and after that uh, mr prem chandavarkar will uh, take over uh, i request all of you to kindly keep your microphones on mute and uh, raise your hand if you have anything to say or comment yeah thank you over to you leo uh, please introduce prem and vandita uh, thank you bargavi uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today uh, more than speakers i think i would like to say they are very actively engaged uh, through their own dimensions of their work in the kind of issues we are going to address uh swandita sharma has a diverse experience being part of the government i mean if you look at her biodata you can see that she has been part of the national rural earth mission sarva shiksha abhiyan uh, i know her from her uh, uh, days in the as the principal secretary of the environment and ecology department but she has also been uh, part of the ministry of civil aviation and prior to that uh, she has also worked uh, you know as deputy commissioner commissioner in various parts of uh, the state particularly also in uh, uh, mandya and asan and uh, she has uh, also served uh, in uh, uh, you know she's she's uh, she's also managed to uh, you know continuously learn uh, in addition to her english literature background Uh, she went on to get a development management degree from uh, asian institute of management in manila uh, uh, when i approached her uh, to be part of this and receive the comments she readily agreed uh, in fact uh, she even tried to uh, she rescheduled many programs to be part of this which is very gracious of her and i thank her for making this a priority uh, i must say that uh, uh, we have involved variety of uh, representatives of various government agencies as we have involved representatives from various sectors uh, and so this would be this is a, been a very enriching experience for us and uh, we would hope that she will uh, you know utilize the action plan that we have brought up and perhaps uh, trouble various departments of the government to push themselves harder and in ensuring bangalore becomes an example across the world not just for this country in uh, not only meeting the paris climate targets which i think is very insufficient we have to go way beyond that to me paris climate targets are very technical uh, but uh, we have to go way beyond it and uh, most recently it has been encapsulated in terms of the ipbs reports uh, where the idea of making biodiversity central to decision making as i mean for groups like us it's always been the issue uh, that biodiversity and environmental management is always a side issue it's retrofitted but if we start looking at everything from an environmental justice perspective Uh, surely it will become a huge step away from the paradigm of development we have got accustomed with uh, which is creating planetary scale problems so i hope she can uh, problematize this at the government level and draw in uh, 
various perspectives from various departments. I must also say that uh, Mr. Gaurav Gupta was the commissioner now. Uh, he started this series with his intervention when he was the administrator of BBMP. So it's in just three months, we have journeyed quite a bit in terms of the range of views that we have received. Uh, so I place it before this audience to basically contextualize how diverse the participation has been. Uh, in fact, this diversity requires a certain level of skill, which is, uh, uh, you know, very rare amongst many of us, uh, but not for Prem. I've seen Prem over the last three decades uh, when we were together in Civic Bangalore and uh, uh, on and off over time. And Prem has been able to conceptualize with and deliver with such simplicity and clarity complex subjects that I'm always enamored by his, uh, you know, is the way he does it uh, and his scholarship on a variety of uh, issues uh, relating to urbanization and governance in particular, uh, but generally uh, in many aspects of our uh, present living. Uh, Prem, as you know, is the managing partner of uh, CNT Architects, which is a, le a leading firm uh, uh, in India. And uh, he has diverse experience as an architect, but he's also uh, been uh, the executive director of Srishti Institute of Art and Design, uh, as he has also uh, taught in various universities, uh, both in the, I mean, all the way from the West to the East. Uh, so geographically also very diverse uh, spread of experiences he has had. Uh, but most importantly to me, uh, Prem is here today to uh, imagine uh, what the future could be based on the experiences we have had interacting over the past three months. Um, what can the future bring to Bangalore? I mean, there is always a uh, best case scenario and a worst case scenario. So uh, we wanted Prem to go through the past eight webinars and come to us uh, with a, with a, you know, make it simple for us to understand if possible and uh, give us a kind of a scenario of what types of actions must follow so we can reverse the damaging pathway that we are now on. So this is my brief introduction to both the speakers today. Janiki is not there. If Janiki was there, she would have helped us in uh, placing this process historically. Uh, because uh, if you read Bangalore's history, uh, in the late 19th century, Bangalore was hit by a pandemic, the plague. And it was also hit very bad by the Spanish flu. Unfortunately, we forget our own history and the Western history does not document the fact that Indians died. I mean, the most deaths took place in South Asia uh, due to the Spanish flu in 1918. So we had asked Bargavi, uh, not Janaki, to uh, uh, relate to those epochal events and how Bangalore re-engineered itself as a, as a city. For instance, many of the neighborhoods which we assume as part of the core Bangalore were built during the time of uh, Devan Sheshadri Ayer all the way to uh, Mirza Ismail. And uh, the, the idea has always been a sanitary movement. Uh, and this city used to be leading in that, uh, which is why it was a uh, most aspired for city to live in. Uh, today, of course, it's become a, a sort of a, a city where you come to make a quick buck, uh, which used to be the situation with the city of gold, Mumbai, but now it's also Bangalore and Hyderabad and Chennai and so on. Uh, so anyway, she would have contextualized the historicity of this process. We believe that uh, uh, participatory processes are critical to resolving the kind of complex situations we, are, we find ourselves in that climate change brings to us. Uh, it cannot happen with a top-down didactic approach, though that has been the way in which the pandemic has been handled. Uh, we would like a ground-up, uh, bottom-up approach, and uh, that's basically the fundamental argument in all of the eight uh, webinars. Uh, yeah, so that's my brief introduction to the speakers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Uh, over to Malavika for a quick recap. Yeah, Malavika. Very, a very good evening to everyone. So uh, I think Prem sir is going to uh, analyze and interpret uh, the discussions that we have had and the findings that have emerged over the last uh, uh, eight uh, sessions. But I'm just going to give a very, very brief overview of um, what has happened just as a, a small introduction. So uh, I would like to share my screen and uh, um, just have the report in the background, the draft report that we've prepared based on um, based on our webinar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so our idea since the very beginning was that um, we wanted to use climate action as um, an opportunity to rectify social injustices and also to integrate uh, climate action into various um, sectors of governance. So we didn't want climate action to be imagined as something separate that needs to be done, but we wanted climate and action on ecological rejuvenation also to become part and parcel of every stream of governance. So that was the idea with which we um, approached this webinar series and um, it also informed who we uh, invited for our webinar. So it uh, ranged from experts to uh, government officials to also community representatives. In the beginning of this uh, uh, of the webinar series, we were able to invite uh, people who were impacted by landfills or um, representatives from the uh, Paura Karmakara Sangha um, who were able to uh, give us perspectives which are usually marginalized. But as the pandemic hit and worsened, our, uh, we weren't able to call as many people as uh, we would have liked to, as diverse as we would have liked the discussions to be, but we did uh, try our best. So what has happened uh, at the end is that we have uh, tried to integrate all our findings into two broad parts in this report. In one section, we have discussed uh, how protection of commons, building food and water security and safeguarding of public health can take place. And in the second, we have spoken about infrastructure, mobility and energy. And all seen from a lens of building inclusivity and um, increasing participation, uh, public participation. So if uh, in our uh, as regards public health, our major findings were that we really need to integrate climate action into public health and we need to center stage health policy. And uh, this should also include uh, protecting workers involved in dealing with the environmental consequences of urbanization, such as solid waste workers. And uh, for commons, as far as commons are concerned, a major theme that emerged was that we need to govern them in a decentralized way. And uh, this also uh, this also involves uh, clearly implementing the existing statutory guidelines and also evolving clear guidelines for local governments to take care of commons, while also ensuring that commons remain accessible to all and also protect traditionally linked livelihoods, for instance, street vendors. And um, we also uh, discussed how commons in as biodiverse places and they should be revived while uh, depending equally on traditional knowledge as well as modern scientific methods. One uh, one uh, very um, uh, striking exa example of this, uh, which we have highlighted in our report, is this um, uh, illustration of how Subramanyapura Kere can be reformed and uh, rejuvenated uh, in an ecologically sound way. And this here at, um, on the top, you can see how uh, ecologically sound principles can be used to also rejuvenate the Rajakala way and how uh, farming can also be integrated into uh, lake uh, restoration. Then we also focused on ensuring water and food equity throughout Bangalore. And we uh, focused on uh, uh, using um, ward level water supply and uh, augmenting it through uh, recycling and rainwater harvesting and um, recycling of water and also um, when uh, when we were discussing food security, we spoke about practices like Akkadi Salu, which are already practiced in parts of rural Karnataka. Uh, it's a practice which involves uh, the use of uh, no chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and uh, minimal groundwater, and it's already practiced. It's a sustainable practice um, prevalent in many parts of rural Karnataka. And we also spoke about um, 
we spoke about how we can um, uh, spread aware not only awareness about organic food but also its accessibility to all sections of society um, and we also spoke about waste management uh, and said that uh, the existing progressive judicial directives that already exist about uh, segregation and processing at source uh, they need to be implemented waste workers need to be uh, protected and uh, their job security and occupational health needs to be um, it needs to be guaranteed. We also spoke about a host of educational initiatives at the heart of which was the idea that we really need to integrate ecological uh, knowledge, wisdom, and a love for uh, your environment into uh, children's education and also in uh, various uh, awareness uh, initiatives that we may undertake. undertake. When it comes to infrastructure, one of the major uh, themes that emerged was that uh, uh, planning, uh, uh, development of infrastructure should ensure that um, uh, that uh, all sections of society are adequately uh, they are adequately consulted. And one way to do this is to have ward level plans which adequately survey and consult. Uh, the local people and understand their diverse infrastructural needs and uh, we also discussed how uh, like and this was uh, a bit obvious like this is uh, something that all of us agree on that um, the built environment obviously needs to be a, a much less resource uh, intensive than it is right now whether it comes to water or energy and we need to integrate green building uh, measures into our bylaws and when it comes to mobility, uh, it was emphasized across the board that we need to abandon uh, destructive infra projects like road widening and flyovers, which not only um, do not solve the problem of mobility, but they also promote uh, usage of uh, private transport, uh, adding to uh, air pollution and uh, increasing energy dependence through fossil fuels. and. Um, we also spoke about um, various ways to um, improve and uh, incentivize public transport and um, non-motorized transport. And um, this was one picture that was um, <clears throat> um, that was shared during our session on mobility, where the um, the benefit of public transport uh, was shown in a self-evident way through the picture. And uh, lastly, we spoke about uh, energy reforming energy production and consumption in the city. And one theme was that we need to ensure a just transition to renewable energy, not just a transition to renewable energy, um, because uh, large scale uh, uh, renewable energy products uh, projects also have their ecological and social impacts. So decentralizing energy production is really important. and. Um, we also uh, spoke about reducing energy consumption and increasing energy efficiency uh, by creating localized markets um, and so on and so forth. So these were some of the themes that emerged. I've given a really quick overview and uh, want to emphasize once again that um, we um, like uh, our aim was to present an integrated uh, uh, vision for governance. So even though here we have uh, presented our findings sector-wise, but uh, in reality, they uh, most of these findings are relevant for each and every sector, uh, which I think uh, um, Prem sir, when he is elaborating on the discussions and interpreting, he will be able to um, give a more nuanced view on. But yeah, so this was a very brief introduction on uh, the findings that emerged from our webinar. So over to Prem sir now. Thank you, thank you, Malavika. Yeah, over to you, Prem. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we need to stop screen sharing. Yeah, yeah great. Okay, um, I'm a bit nervous because very high expectations have been laid out uh, for what I'm supposed to do. But uh, anyway, um, what I am going to do is uh, take a sort of broader overview 
if i look at the reports on the on the on the in this whole series of webinars they've all been great and the suggestions they make are eminently sensible so just to name some of the key ones uh, that you have to involve stakeholders and civil society you must restore inclusive viable biodiverse and healthy commons we should have decentralized and participatory governance there should be better monitoring of data on air water waste there should be water and food equity we should have organic inputs and methods in food production we should reform energy loops we should prioritize public over private transit we need education all all of these are, are eminently sens sensible and we can't uh, sort of contest them but i felt that what was missing is an understanding of the nature of the beast the, the prevailing system that by you know that governs the behavior of both climate and cities and that is something we have to understand because otherwise we'll be working against a logic that that is really driving the system and and uh, our efforts are doomed to be limited so what i'll do is i'd i'd like to speak first at a general philosophical level on the systems overview and then get into some specifics of the dimensions of what bengaluru's climate action plan should be and the systemic perspective i want to emphasize is that climate as well as cities are are very similar as systems in the sense that they are both inherently non linear complex and emergent so let me explain what that is but due to the constraints of time i'll have to be simplistic a linear system has a direct relationship between input and output a small input produces a small output a large input a large output but in a non linear system there is not necessarily a relationship a large input can produce a small output and a small input can cause huge output in uh, climate science this was uh, this recognition was pioneered by the work of edward lorenz who was a mathematician and a meteorologist uh, i suggest you look him up there's a lot of writing on his work and and he showed that in climate small differences in initial conditions can in a complex set of self reinforcing loops result in a massive change in final conditions uh, the popular term given to lorenz's work is the butterfly effect that a, a butterfly flapping its wings in one place can uh, lead to a massive storm uh, in another place uh, i can't get into the more detail explanation of it but that i want to just emphasize this aspect of non linear systems that you can't relate input and output so very easily to uh, illustrate the issue of complexity i think the best uh, uh, illustration is a very classic paper written by a scientist called warren weaver and he wrote this way back in 1948 in the 1950s he was a scientific advisor to the us president and his paper is titled science and complexity and he he says there are three kinds of scientific problems the first is called organized simplicity where the entire situation can be uh, described in an overall conceptual model perhaps a set of equations but otherwise a conceptual model and this has dominated science and it has dominated a lot of uh, other things it has uh, affected the way we look at cities where we where we say something like a master plan so there's an overall logic that we can you know capture in the system the second category we were identified is disorganized complexity where you can't really the system is so uh, complex and uh, and it's such a multitude that you can't resolve it through any conceptual analysis the best you can do is apply statistical techniques to understand it but the third category which we were identified as a characteristic of living systems which was at 1948 he said this has not been sufficiently studied a lot of work has been done since this is what he called self organizing complexity and really that is the nature of living systems the the, the components evolve from the bottom up by interact interacting between themselves and they bring order out of chaos they organize themselves our body is a self organizing entity 
it's not it's not there's not someone pulling the strings like a puppeteer to make it uh, happen the way it does it, it it's all self organizing so the characteristics of a self organizing system is emergence which is the capacity of a system to hold fundamental properties at its core that did not exist in an earlier state of the system uh one one of the sort of classic examples cited in biology to talk about emergence is a termite's nest uh, a large nest is equivalent to a human mega structure that might be 3 kilometers wide 4 kilometers high and it has functional zoning it has waste recycling it has temperature control humidity control uh, spaces for burying the dead and a whole lot of it's it's actually superbly organized except there is no class of master planner termites it just, the, and biologists for a long time just couldn't find them and they thought maybe it's just the experimental technique is limited and one day someone will find these master planner termites but eventually it is found that the, this order does not come out of any master plan the way it works is that a termite when it moves it exudes a, a kind of chemical which is classified as a pheromone and the termites that follow can smell that pheromone to understand the pattern of how termites before it have moved and actually that whole order out of that you know out of the chaos comes because termites are genetically programmed with a set of very simple rules like if you smell a pheromone trail like this then place a piece of mud like that and that's how it all evolves so if you step back what are the conditions for emergence first there has to be very frequent daily synchronous interaction face to face interaction next every action leaves a visible trace there is an inherent impulse within that system towards recognizing patterns in the traces and then acting according to the patterns one sees there is high information symmetry because all information is in the public domain nothing is externalized all participants and the results and components remain within the system they are part of the system there is a low preoccupation with grand design the focus is just on immediate experience Uh, Stephen Johnson, who's written one of the classic books on this subject, says our brain functions through emergence, and uh, the system would collapse if 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 some grand design was forced on it, or if each neuron sought to be individually sentient. Our brain works with all its wonder and beauty because just of this of this emerge principle of emergence, connections, finding patterns, responding to those patterns. and lastly the system develops through iterative evolutionary spirals now this is not the way we are schooled we are schooled to come up with overarching conceptual descriptions and what we don't realize is as the way we intuitively behave uh, let me give you an example of friendship we don't find friends because we first construct a theory of friendship or a strategy of friendship or a master plan for friendship in fact if you try doing any of those you probably would not have any friends we have friends just because we spend time with them and then in our resonances of likes and dislikes we find patterns and then we uh, reinforce those patterns we can be listen and we speak and we laugh and dance and whatever and then one day a friendship becomes a core property of the system that's the two of us of me and my friend which did not at all exist in the earlier in the first meeting so so that's what emergence is the core property emerges like this so so we have to understand that this is the nature of the beast of being complex and emergent and we have to uh, act accordingly now there are limitations of forcing our simplistic uh, so called scientific logic onto a complex system the first one is, is there's a challenge to incentivize any change in behavior because you cannot offer a, a sort of assurance that if you behave like this that will happen climate doesn't work that way 
you just have to offer a general sort of feel good goal saying oh it will be nice to do this but it's very difficult to incentivize changes of behavior by actually saying that but being a complex system we can't do that we have to realize that analysis cannot effectively predict the future just analysis just sitting back and you know like the philosopher in the ivory tower work out the problem and then we just go apply it uh if we try and do that we wind wind up being stuck in abstractions then because we are in abstractions we we will have a tendency towards partial solutions which are bound to fail we will distort the system because we'll either externalize things or we remove feedback loops which are so crucial to the system functioning or we don't realize the extent to which we are fragmenting the system which creates a different form of externalization once all that happens we create opportunities for self interested actors to act outside the system and alternative agendas start fighting each other and then we wind up creating abstractions rather than the reality so for example understanding nature we socialize it as an aesthetic spectacle rather than seen as an you know as a, a set of ecological flaws so for example uh, uh, you know there was some press recently of redoing carbon park and just saying we we'll had fiberglass bridges and we we'll had these beautiful fountains and 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 uh, soundscape gardens and things like that so so the city becomes just this aesthetic spectacle and is not understood in its root in ecology and then we create inappropriate scale focus we start looking from the top down rather than bottom up and because of all this because of all these partial uh, uh, views abstractions uh, the inability to incentivize behavior change uh, inability to mobilize people into being part of the system the inertia of dysfunctional systems will prevail so my fear is unless we recognize this complexity a lot of these very well meaning goals that have been defined in previous uh, discussions uh, will be doomed to to being limited so uh, now let's focus on what uh, bengaluru's action plan should be and looking at this idea of complexity non linearity emergence i identify 10 uh, points that we need to look at number 1 everyone is the system we are not separate from nature we are not separate from each other we can come together as a cohesive system and i think there's no doubt that without cohesive action we are not going to fulfill any climate agenda so we have to start with that saying everyone is the system everything is the system number 2 once you accept that everyone is a system and everything is a system the building block becomes recognizing those components recognizing those people the building block is not some abstract theory not an established paradigm uh let me let me give you a concrete example we have a master plan for the city which rests on the idea of a land use plan which that is it delineates parcels of land it says what should come on that land it delineates building codes it uh, delineates a process by which you can build a statutory process by which you can build and uh, the values of these land parcels tend to be determined by uh, market forces now if you look at that firstly we have a very inefficient very opaque bureaucratic and corruption ridden land markets so our prices are artificially high they bear, they bear no relation to median incomes so if you look at the impact of land uh, values if you look at the impact of the kind of formalized processes by which you can build under the master plan you will find that somewhere around half the city's population at a conservative estimate and i suspect it is more than half uh, is actually marginalized by the system they cannot operate within the master plan and we and we see this uh, in front of our eyes we look at the number of spaces the number of people who operate outside the paradigm of master planning whether it is a slum whether it is an unregulated layout whether it is your local kirana shop uh, whether it is your street hawker uh, there's so many kind of spaces these all spaces that do not 
uh, fall within the central paradigm. So what, what that means is like half the population is criminalized because they, you can't legally locate yourself on a master plan. In fact, the, the, the uh, underprivileged segment of our population in cities in Bengaluru and in practically every Indian city has survived because master planning is so weak, uh, both in ideation and implementation that has given them space for the informal systems of tenure by which they survive. But if we say we have better planning, if we have to say better coordination as needed to fulfill a, a climate agenda, then, then we're just going to accentuate this division unless we recognize it. And, and the only way to recognize it is the building block of complexity, which is recognition. Point number three, we have to rest on pattern recognition for which we need feedback loops. And this is, this is really missing in our system. Uh, for example, in one of the earlier seminars, there was someone from the Karnataka State Pollution Control Board who talked about some of the initiatives that were being taken. And again, each of these are very uh, worthy and credible. Uh, so increase air monitoring stations, increase e-waste collection centers, increase plastic collection centers, uh, all, all these things. But, but it's as though if you just do these things, it's enough, it's a starting point. Whereas how the data from these increased centers feedbacks, feeds back into the system and how the system adapts and responds to the pattern recognition, that's not thought of. And this is, this is something we need to uh, really think of because it's unfortunately become part of our culture in, uh, in India where, I mean, you, you lay the foundation stone and you think 80% of the work is done. So you have to realize that it's actually you're just launching an ongoing process that is never done that survives on feedback loops of continuous adaptation. Now these feedback loops brings me to point number four because they are the major way you can incentivize changes of behavior. Because right now what we tend to do is we use the language of science or we use the language of statistics to try and argue the case. And while uh, this language is very logical, it is also immobilizing. It's very difficult. You get weighed down by data and you don't know what to do. What you need to create is, is a joy of individual agency to believe that I can do something, I make a difference, I can, I can help. And that is how you uh, pull people into it. And to pull people in it, you have to create the feedback loop where they just see this response to what they've done, what they've mobilized to do. Right now, our systems are too abstracted for that and we don't put emphasis on this uh, feedback loop. To create effect effective feedback loops brings me to point number five is that you need hierarchies of scale. Uh, and this, this is where we get into the importance of decentralization because you will not see the impact of what you have done unless you, you see it locally. And so we have to create local autonomy and, and only through that, we can not only harness the energy of voluntary effort because people are seeing the feedback and they're adapting to the feedback and they, then they get more feedback and more adaptation. But you also capture nuance. You know, what works in one part of the city doesn't work in another and capturing nuance is so crucial. Uh, local nuance is so crucial to uh, uh, what, uh, to if uh, for if effective change like our brain the neurons work just by connecting as much as possible with adjacent neurons and looking at local patterns and then these scale up to the to the level of the whole brain each each system is not trying to each uh, neuron is not trying to think what is the whole brain doing it's just you know starting with local action and then there's there's feedback both you know across the scale hierarchies Scale hierarchies, uh, now I come to point six, have to work on the principle of subsidiarity, which says the higher levels in a system are subsidiary to the lowest levels. The lowest levels are fundamental. So the way it works is the lowest level does the maximum possible. And what it cannot do at that level, it delegates upwards. So, so clearly you start with that and you'll find that, okay, at a ward level, you can't design a mass transit system. You do need to delegate that, that upwards. 
But if you want to look at water harvesting, if you want to look at uh, waste recycling, if you want to look at energy recycling, a lot of those things work really well at the local level. Number seven, we have to rethink our imagination of the city. And if you, if you look at the way, just graphically read the way the, uh, the master plan is drawn, uh, you'll understand uh, what I'm talking about, that the city is treated as this bounded entity. Uh, so I think maybe that comes from the fact that cities uh, historically started off as fortified entities and those defined by a wall around them. So we, we tend to draw, this is the boundary of Bengaluru and we say it's a rigid line and what's inside is Bengaluru urban, what's outside is Bengaluru rural. And it's almost like, okay, we'll just look at urban. We don't necessarily need to look at the rural. Uh, I, so so that you just look at inside the boundary, you don't look at outside the boundary. Uh, a more powerful metaphor uh, which was suggested by a thinker called John Thackera is uh, to think of the city like a sponge. A sponge has a defined shape like a city. You can recognize its shape, but it also has a porosity and flows can move through it. So then you realize there are flows of water, flows of food, flows of energy moving through the city and you start looking at it more from a systems perspective of how these flows work. So we need to uh, rethink this whole imagination of what the city is. And, and, and these metaphors are actually quite powerful because they liberate new ways of thinking. And we have to realize the paralysis forced on us by some of our abstract metaphors we've been working with. Uh, number eight, we need holistic governance. Uh, this, is, this is a really serious problem in, in uh, uh, India and uh, even so in Bengaluru. Uh, we have fragmentation uh, first between the state and the city where the city is really not empowered to look at its uh, future. Uh, we have fragmentations into parastatal agencies where each one is just looking at one piece of the puzzle. So to just give you one example, uh, one of the points that has uh, uh, been highlighted in previous discussions is the issue of water. And we need to look at water differently and how it can be recycled. But we have water supply uh, managed by the BWSSP and we have stormwater runoff managed by the BBMP. Uh, they don't work together on these. So the water system is fragmented. We can't look at the water cycle in its totality. And neither of these agencies has, has a real uh, sort of a powerful say in shaping what the, the uh, urban plan and urban management strategies other than looking at what is just within their domain. So we need to look at this uh, very completely. And, uh, uh, and, and this might mean looking at some uh, <clears throat> overarching legislations uh, and be willing to take a sort of radical attitude towards them. I remember a few years ago, Leo and I and many others attended uh, some discussions with the Secretary of Urban Development. And uh, this was because 20 years after the 74th Amendment had been passed, more than 20 years, uh, the, the government was yet to define the rules by which ward committees would function. And then they were forced to do that through because of a high court judgment uh, and ESG was a moving force in that, uh, in that high court case. Uh, it was to do with waste management uh, and how to decentralize it at the ward level. So we attended these brainstorming meetings on how ward committee rules could work. And we found that whatever suggestions we came up with to make really effective ward committees uh, the answer was we can't do that because that would conflict with the way the Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act is defined. And to def change that act means going back to the legislature, which is a huge and complicated process. So we can't do that. Obviously, we're going to limit ourselves if we take that kind of an approach. If you're really serious about a climate action plan, we have to take a radical overview and look at overarching legislations like this and bring them in line with this you know, harnessing the complexity and energy within the city. Number nine, we need radical transparency. That, that is that everything has to be out in the public domain. Otherwise, emergence will not happen. 
and you get alternative agents uh, agendas working and these these have to work both within and across scale hierarchies so for example one one of the uh, speakers in one of the seminars uh, pointed out how the waste management uh, in bengaluru is controlled by a waste mafia this is possible only when there's opacity if there's transparency it's very difficult for a mafia to take place so uh, to take root so so we have to realize that uh, we we need uh, that this has to be the driving force transparency otherwise we will not get systematic behavior systemic behavior will not we will not get systemic change and number 10 um, is the the whole effort of city planning and management has to completely change in two two ways one is rather than trying to uh, go to one overarching master plan or one overarching strategy the goal should actually be to resolve conflict between multiple strategies to allow these strategies to emerge to flower and and just see that we remove potential conflicts and so that they can align and that alignment is driven by the second thing that city planning and management needs to focus on which is to to articulate a vision and drive it because only then we'll get the alignment we're looking at and not only articulate and drive it but define how we measure progress toward that vision and then share measurement of the progress at a rapid frequency i would say like monthly you know that often not just annual survey that's too slow a feedback loop so we need a really rapid frequency of feedback loops and the empowerment at the local level to to uh, develop its own adaptive strategies so in conclusion i'd like to tell a story about a neglected figure in indian history and uh, unfortunately not the story of an indian he was a, he was scottish and he was an amazing polymath who covered a a variety of fields but he's also known as the father of modern urban planning and that's patrick geddes and one of the things we don't realize is that patrick geddes devoted substantive attention to india uh, he spent a decade of his life in india uh, between 1914 and 1924 and during that time largely commissioned by the princely states authored close to 50 town plans uh, some of them are very sketchy, just of a few pages. Some of them are very detailed, like the one for Indore, which goes into two volumes. But what Geddes uh, took a very different approach to the way we do town planning now. He said, first, you need to do very detailed surveys. And he talked about three kinds of surveys. Uh, the survey of the physical form, the survey of ecology, and the survey of the culture and traditions of the city. And then your plan has to follow the principle of what he called, he used the metaphor, conservative surgery. And he, was, he chose this metaphor very carefully. He was, he was really using it like it's medical equivalent, where you uh, recognize that the body has its own healing power. You allow the energy of that healing power to flower, and you only perform surgery just to remove what is really wrong, what is obstruct, obstructing that healing power. So interventions in city plan should be that way rather than constructing some abstract paradigm like a grid plan or something like that and forcing it on the city. But I'd like you to tell you one story that really illustrates this approach. And uh, this is a chapter in a biography of Gedi's written by Philip Boardman. And it, the title of the chapter is Maharaja for a Day. And it's about Geddes in Indore. And Indore, uh, I think this was around 1920 or 21. And Indore was suffering from the plague at that time. And uh, Geddes was going around doing his surveys and uh, everyone he realized people were looking at him rather suspiciously. And, uh, and he, he pushed his translator to translate what they were saying. And they were saying, he said, the translator said, they're saying, here's this foreigner who's bringing the plague to us. And then Geddes got empowered by the Maharaja of Indore to, to take control for a short time. I mean, it was called Maharaja for a day, but I assume it was a few, several days. 
and Diwali was coming up and uh, typically the, uh, every year there was a procession that was uh, uh, for which the Maharaj was the patron, he funded it uh, through the city. So Gedis took control of that procession. And he said, rather than its uh, traditional route, which is devised by the geography of temples across the city and things like that, he, he declared that the route of the procession would go by which are the cleanest streets in the city. Then he harnessed local initiative in each street, each mohalla, each neighborhood to, to sort of come together to work on cleaning. And he created a free garbage removal service. And, and this made a really radical change and the city really cleaned up a great deal. In fact, at the end of this whole initiative, Geddes was known as the foreigner who removed the plague, not the one who brought the plague. But the incident I want to focus on is when the procession finally happened, uh, Geddes made sure that the sweepers of Indore, who in Bengaluru we call the Paurakarmikas, were a very important part of the procession. And when they uh, passed by where he was standing watching the procession, he stepped out into the procession and personally greeted and acknowledged them. And the leader of the sweepers union had a garland of marigolds and uh, Gedis took out one marigold from that garland and put it in his buttonhole. Now, the interesting thing is after that happened, the mayor of Indore, who was a local, came and said to Gedis, you did this great thing. And he said, I as a Brahmin cannot go and meet those speakers. I'm not allowed to, I would violate strictures of purity. But you as a European are free from such strictures so you could do what you did. And I, I think this really characterizes the way we approach cities. We, uh, the way we run it is like we are like the mayor of Indore, if not liberated from notions of pure caste purity and all that, we stick with the purity of certain ways of doing things, a certain paradigm of urban planning. And we force that on the system. And we're not like Geddes, who's willing to step forward, study the system, harness, it, harness its energy, get his hands dirty and really engage with it. So I think then we have to realize that cities are like nature complex and self-organizing. And I think this is proven by how our cities have survived, even though the reach of urban planning and management is so severely limited. So rather than searching for a new philosophy, a new management plan, a new science, our planning and management of cities must embrace complexity and self-organization. We should do this not only because complex systems are more cohesive and resilient, but above all, because complex systems adapt much faster. If you try and force simplicity onto a complex system, not only will we fail, but we'll slow down the rate of change. So it is precisely because of the urgency of the climate crisis that we must shift away from seeking grand solutions and we must embrace complexity. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. Thank you for that wonderful, thought-provoking um, piece from you. The 10 points that you gave us are something that we will have to really work on. And the very uh, powerful stories uh, which sent a message uh, across uh, I'm sure you will stay on uh, since it is seven o'clock. I now request uh, Mrs. Vandita Sharma to uh, speak and then we can have an interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, ma'am. So um, first of all, uh, let me thank you for inviting me for this uh, very necessary webinar today. It's not only the need of the hour, 
it's also actually it was the need of the hour long back many years ago many decades ago we've been talking about this and we really need to focus a lot on this aspect so thank you very much apart from that i also want to thank all of you for having uh, um, employed yourself into developing a very useful action plan for the city and uh, coming out with a list of suggestions which are very very important and also very topical and of course uh, speaking after the i can say very erudite exposition of mr prem chandavarkar i really don't think i can do justice however being a government servant i'll try to uh, respond and also not only to what he has said but also to the to what malvika had presented earlier because ultimately it is for us to harness the thought pro thought processes of the experts and to ensure and find a way and methodology of implementing them appropriately and encouraging anyway i'll go further i'll not uh, yet get into a couple of things which i was about to say the undoubtedly we all know and i really don't have to say this again bangalore definitely is not only growing it's growing at a very fast rate mega metropolitan city and we have been grappling over the last few decades with various problems and we really cannot isolate climate change environment and ecology from everything else and 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 there i am fully in agreement with the sentiments that have been expressed from the beginning of this uh, webinar undoubtedly it is a question of not only just you know afforestation or protecting water or whatever it is actually like you have presented in your um, draft action plan it's a matter of social equity too it, it has to involve every single section of society and we need to look at how the the impact of each and every category is taking place is is happening in the city so we really can't work in silos and probably and as it was very rightly pointed out the government has this great habit of working in silos this is how uh, we have been functioning over the years and this is how we are functioning even now there are attempts to being made to break those silos and to try to you know uh, bring the about coordinated action so first and foremost i i would like to say that yes i went to um, the draft that uh, malvika had presented so it is it's a very good uh, uh, draft very simply put and it's a, it encompasses it's a very wide encompassing uh, approach which also builds in uh, the na nature the requirement for an equitous growth in the society and an organic growth because the city as he has already said it it is a complex organism and also it has to come down to the micro level so overall i i fully i fully agree with the approach that this entire thought process is taking over the last few webinars and we really need to move towards that um now coming to what government can do what government has done or been has been doing i'm not even going to talk about it because there is no point i'm not we are not here you all of you know what is happening in the city and what government has done see everybody in their own way try to do what is best in the given circumstances so there are efforts made by everyone by the governmental agencies as well as by the non governmental agencies some are accepted some are not accepted some bring about the right fruits some don't so whatever has happened in its own wisdom government has been doing 
but yes i i am fully with you that we need to do stakeholder consultation and we need to take suggestions and we need to work out on an action plan which is required for the city and not only for the city actually i look after i for me karnataka as a whole is very important and probably in passing i will mention here that we are developing a karnataka state action plan on climate change there was one developed in 2015 which all of you may be aware of and now um, a second revision of that is taking place uh, with the nationally determined uh, contributions which is the heart of the paris uh, agreement as you all know we have we are trying but that focuses on a much larger um, aspect of the entire state and bangalore of course has to be a part of that and we are working with the government of india also on that and of course uh, various other agencies well that will come up for stakeholder consultation too slowly um now coming to bangalore one very good thing that has happened and i think probably has been the catalyst for this webinar series if i am not wrong was the letter written by the uh, commissioner bbmp in january to the uh, c40 regarding the membership of bangalore for c40 because i think we've been talking about that for quite some time but here some commitments were given a little more concretized commitments were given and we have to now participate in that and we have to take it forward and some where like uh, uh ms bhargavi rao mentioned we have lost sight but of that because one of course one reason is that we have been swept away in the last few months actually in the last one and a half years due to the pandemic it has it has impacted uh, adversely the regular work which has been happening though we've been grappling with that too trying to ensure that the regular work also uh, continues however this aspect needs a little more thinking and i'm i'm very thankful to all of you um, i'm very grateful that you have not let that die down you have continued to think about this aspect and you have um, already uh, drafted and come out with some suggestions on a draft action plan for climate change as far as bangalore is concerned now uh, just by way of information i was checking with bbmp Uh, as to what we have done as a follow up action because bbmp actually doesn't come under my jurisdiction i mean i mean to be very frank but that doesn't matter that doesn't matter because as we said government should not function in silos so um the bbmp has actually started thinking about it too they have issued some government order or something on an app. Uh, action plan but that really needs to be worked out further and we really need to talk to c40 also further on this and i at after this i must be i am really thankful to you for inviting me for this because i was not aware of the kind of action required for c40 so i have contacted them and i have contacted uh, the uh, regional director and we are going to take it forward along with them too because um, as per this um, agreement or this decision to go with the c40 group we also have to develop on various aspects you know we have to do a mapping of the emissions of the green housing uh, houses um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions emissions and that mapping has not been done yet we have not done that anything we have to uh, further then probably there are they have their own systems also which we which are useful um and we really need we have to go forward and feed that and then do a trajectory of the uh, i mean of the kind of strategies that can be developed on the basis of the uh, they have something called series and some uh, which is a um, portal which on uh, which on which you have to feed all that and also you are all aware of that and the pathways to like in to know and we really need to work on that to ensure see that you know we work out a few models of the trajectory that bangalore can take so that is a macro level effort which has to be done so we we will we will need to work a little on that but apart from that i i fully um am in sync with what you have uh, presented today uh, mr chanda worker because i was noting down all your points that you have given all apart from the earlier uh, disposition you all these 10 points which are much more practical and which you have given 
are really, really important. So the first and foremost takeaway of, from this is, yes, we have to have a local level micro bottoms up approach, which I fully understand and it is so important. And we need to involve every single section of society in that. Uh, definitely, definitely focusing on those sections which are marginalized. I mean, you use the word, I mean, for karmikas, of course, you even mentioned like street vendors, like the master plans don't even provide um, uh, provide for this kind of uh, marginalized people because probably in the minds of the master planners, they don't exist you know, because they, they are also there. I mean, they are, we, we are blind to uh, some of these people. We are not blind to very um, the upper strata of society. So that is a very big important point that these are critical stakeholders whom we have to uh, involve in the work, not only for the city, but we also, also, and I'm very happy that this has come in your draft action plan. We also have to focus on the health, the education and similar social aspects so that nobody is left behind. Sanitation, no, nobody is left behind. So that is that has to be a part of the um, action plan and the focus areas that have to be done. So that is something which we really need. So ward level and below ward level, whatever act, uh, we need to involve. So it has to be a mass movement. We will have to do a mass movement. We will also have to ensure that we hear the public. You know, we have to give them a forum, a platform to talk. And not only this platform, now this platform is of people who have, all of you have a lot of experience and expertise in this line. So we really need to lend an ear to this, um, this data. And this is something which I, I was delighted to read in the uh, draft action plan when I was uh, going through it today in the afternoon. Um, then the other issues are also like uh, of, um, vision overall vision so we will have to build on that and we we will as first and foremost see from this strata when we uh, we move up from the public it is the bureaucracy which has to handhold uh, and take it forward so the bureaucracy will have to be various sections not just the bbmp alone bbmp alone with its blinkers cannot develop this this has to be a um, multi-organic kind of an intervention with various departments also coming in with various secretaries we'll have to in fact uh, in the morning I was talking to the chief commissioner of BBMP and we were saying we will have to create um, a platform within the government also to encourage and to bring about an interaction and discussion with all the um, related uh, secretaries of the various departments to ensure that we don't leave out any um, any category, any, and I'm not talking the threat of society. I'm uh, talking of the um, subject. What what are the subjects of various, like forest and ecology is there, that is the one silo. Urban development has two silos actually. One for the uh, non-BBMP area and the other one for the BBMP area. There are so many, that's how government has been functioning. So having said that, it's a matter of you know bringing the bureaucracy to be involved in this. However, that's not going to be the end of it. We will have to take it to the legislature where it matters. Like you gave in the end, you mentioned about the Maharaja of Indore. If the Maharaja of Indore had not given that freedom and that encouragement, probably Indore would not have seen that movement coming up at that level. So we have to encourage, educate our Maharaja of Indore and ensure that the Maharaja of Indore participates in this and gets uh, more and more aware and also supports everyone. And of course, the role of the bureaucracy is very critical because it is between the two, between the public and also between the public representatives who are who are actually talking to the public. So it's not that um, that they are not they are cut off from them. They are also part of them, but they have their own uh, way of thinking. So we will have to work together on this and develop a vision towards where we want to go and how we want to move uh, towards this. 
so it, i i i am uh, completely so it's a holistic development which will have to be looked at and we will have to uh, bring in like here you gave the example of even bwssb and bbmp not talking about and i can tell you that i have myself seen that happen and just by chance today i had to call bwssb and bbmp to sit down in front of me and sort out a very minor small little problem it's not my area i don't look after urban development but we were so frustrated with some things and we had to call the chief engineers and talk to them and say, please talk to each other and sort out these things so these are i i agree you have uh, pinpointed the problems which are systemic also so overall it's not just that you know developing an action plan the systemic changes also are required in within the government to ensure to grow with the changing times and we really need to look at how even one thought process or one objective uh, can involve so many different departments now here we are talking of um, developing a climate change action plan and how it can in involve from transport department from uh, energy department from uh, education department and health department and uh, all all the various uh, departments now we, we we will have to look at um, all these aspects holistically the urban transport the, the, the green buildings what are our uh, Uh, how is it that we promote them what is it that can be done and all these issues there already a lot of work has been done and government has come out with very uh, quite a few schemes for incentivizing low cost energy and also um, energy which is uh, renewable plus um, um, uh, other uh, solar installations etc i will not get into all that so and also for afforestation now forest department and greening of the areas so there there is no doubt about it that this is an expansive wide uh, subject which we really need to take up and we need to work not only in sync with the uh, stakeholders we also need to work together within the government system and we need to bring the maharaja of indore into the small picture along with us by more awareness so th there is it is it's not um, that easy because government has got its own you know the systems have now sort of got engraved in stone because they have been there for 30 40 years and since independence we have developed that we have not really changed much we are trying to change but doesn't happen however probably if we have to look at our future generation and if we have to ensure that the um, the, the forthcoming years are not years of misery and at the way we are going today it's definitely we are going towards a pretty doomsday kind of a scenario so we will have to change not only our way of thinking we will have to change our way of working and i i mean i'm completely with you on this and so we will look at all these things and um, uh, all the uh, suggestions which will finally come out also from your um, action plan and um, uh, another thing is regarding the see we will the the most important thing is regarding sustainability so whatever comes out is it's very important that we not only have a, a sustainable action plan we implement it in a manner that it's carried forward so we will have to do a lot of iec also awareness programs along with the people having developed our own objectives and our own implementation plans and also um, how do we look at it how do we go about the entire um, uh, plans we will have to uh, we will have to have it has to come up from the bottom once there is a uh, ward level or even lower level ward level is probably a good uh, area point that those kind of plans become the foundation for an overarching plan for the city that is something which will involve the people so the ownership on that plan has to be with the people in fact uh, it you see we karnataka has been actually a pioneer in such things which all of you know uh, somewhere down the line we have lost it you know we had i don't know whether you recall long back we had developed water user uh, committees in the rural areas 
and some of them had functioned many of them had functioned very well very well and but somewhere we we sort of you know that that encouragement lost uh, lost out and somehow they have become a little more they have become defunct now but we need to do that see in fact actually we are developing a water policy also and in that we are looking at the most important thing is community participation in that so th th there is no doubt about it that it is the city belongs to the people and the people have to take ownership of the city and we are there to only support them and to help them in whatever way possible so all this would be it will be great if we can also your suggestions um, are there already and this can be strengthened in the um, action plan that you are suggesting and this can come out come to the government and to the bbmp first and then from there to the government it will be wonderful to have this kind of a uh, suggestion uh, this kind of an action plan and a visionary so these are some of the things i really don't know uh, from a government representative what else uh, you are expecting because um, they i don't want to i was given a list of schemes i was asking somebody well, well, i really have to talk and they gave me a list of schemes that we have done i'm really not getting into that however i get the gist of the entire uh, uh, the movement that we are looking at it has to be a movement and it has to be a movement with the public with the support of the government with the support of the public representatives so let's work together in this let's work together Thank you. I really, I think that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, ma'am, and uh, thank you for recognizing uh, the need for uh, you know a holistic uh, action on this. The need for everybody's voices to be heard, and you use the word uh, multi-organic. Uh, thank you. And uh, we have a few questions, so without wasting time, we'll get. Uh, into them and I would also like Leo uh, to take a few questions because um, many of the questions are uh, about the kind of work uh, ESD has done in the context of the public interest litigations. Uh, my colleague Sana has uh, put all the questions in a Google Doc and made it very easy for me. So, that, so some of these questions are to frame. Uh, so Mahesh Kashyap asks who selects the ward committee members? Uh, Prem can uh, take this, but uh, Leo can also add to it. Yeah, Prem, over to you. I think I'll defer to Leo on this one. He knows much more about it uh, directly than I do. Okay, okay, over to you, Leo, but please be brief. We have a lot more coming, yeah. Uh, Leo? You're muted, Leo. Oh, yeah. uh, one of those things. Uh, that Zoom has made us uh, comfortable with, you're muted. Uh, I was saying that when I went through all the questions, uh, quite a few, in fact, a substantial number are actually about the very idea of access to governance. And uh, the complaint uh, from various questioners is basically the same, either in terms of representativeness, uh, the local governance system is lacking, or in terms of how the local governance system is structured, it is not representative. So that's broadly what the questions are. And then the mechanistics of who is chosen and how that person is on that committee and so on. Uh, so I don't want to go into that in this event because that requires a separate discussion. Uh, but broadly, I can say this that, uh, yes, so as Prem said, the I court has played a remarkable role in ensuring the 73rd and 74th amendments to the constitution at some effect in people's lives. But as Prem knows, uh, you know, from the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, through civic and multiple other processes and through ESG also, we have worked to ensure that the promise of the constitution was realized. And there is a lot of resistance and Ms. Sharma has uh, uh, sort of alluded to that, uh, both from the bureaucracy and also the legislature in allowing public access to governance. It is the public's government, but the government puts the public out of governance. That's been by and large the experience and the questions all speak to that. That said, what the courts have done is to actually, you know, not just open up fissures, but actually break open windows into the citadel that has been built. Uh, I mean, uh, we all remember that we used to 
access Vidhan Sodha like it was our backyard. Now to go to Vidhan Sodha is like uh, worse than entering the fortress of Kempe Goda. It is so impossible. Uh, so, and that's the, it's not just a metaphor, it's actually the physical experience of accessing government systems. So my sense would be that the idea of decentralization is to take power out of those buildings and place it where they belong, which is with the people. And the ward committees are one manifestation of where power should be located. It is going to be a messy process. And I completely agree with uh, Prem that uh, chaos is not disorderliness. And decentralization will be a chaotic process because there are multiple forms. Because if you try to see order and discipline, which is predominantly a middle class view, I think we'll create a lot of, again, what he said was we will criminalize a whole range of people. So to ensure that tradition, culture, and people's aspirations, which are as diverse as they are, find ways, there is no option but to actually decentralize. So in the document that we have collated, which is an outpouring of various visions of multiple people. I just asked my colleague, how many people came prepared to be panelists in this uh, webinar series? We had 41 speakers, including today's, and we had over 700 participants, distinctive participants. Many of them may have repeated, but so many of them are groups and unions and uh, so on. So what we find is a thirst for engagement, uh, a real felt need to ensure that bureaucracy and legislative power, uh, both from the local government perspective and also from the state government perspective, comes and dwells within the people's uh, understanding of the futures. And that is why the document we written is repeatedly asserting uh, that aspect. Uh, that said, I also want to uh, say that when you run through the questions, you find that uh, there is a lot of confusion in terms of the government speaking uh, in a language which is uh, understood. Uh, and again, here we have seen the judiciary intervene. And I just want to give uh, two uh, recent examples. One is Mr. Sarfraz Khan had held a meeting two weeks ago with some of us. Uh, he is the joint commissioner of BBMP relating to solid waste management. He was directed by the chief justice to hold a meeting with some of us who are petitioners in that uh, case, which has been going on from 2012. And the direction was really made multiple times from last year. But finally, it happened two weeks ago. And in that one hour meeting, we basically resolved most of the issues uh, that are relating to solid waste management. The one thing that stuck in my mind was a simple proposal I made. I said, we keep talking about power karmikas in tokenistic ways. But real power should reside in them. So real power would be if two power karmikas in every ward are part of the ward committee. So that also explains how People are nominated. Most of them are relatives and friends of the corporate. What if you had people who are working systemically, also representative on such committees? If it happened in panchayats, Anganwadi workers would be there. So elitism goes out of the door. The caste class domination goes out of the door. And Geddes and the Maharaja would both be sitting together in every panchayat and every ward committee, you know, and all the time. And uh, I'm sure Ms. Sharma would be happy that, you know, if she went in, she would be treated as much equally as we would treat a power karmika or the chairperson of uh, the panchayat or the chairperson of the committee. See, what, what needs to happen is, as I have always said, I saw this in Brazil. In the Workers' Party's revolution in Brazil, one of the things that happened was structures of power got grounded. They got spread out. And I, the visual representation was the mayor of a city took us to meet the workers who were cleaning up the city and you know the equivalent of power karmikas. One of the first thing that struck my mind is he went and hugged and embraced each and every one of them as if they were friends. And it was not a show. He knew their names, he knew their families, he inquired about them. Now I've never seen any mayor except Lawrence Fernandez that was in the eighties actually do that. So you know what I'm saying? I, Lawrence Fernandez came from the trade union movement. So perhaps that, that kind of, uh, quality of leadership is missing in our elected representatives, but it is not something that we should say it was in the past. It has to be become the present and the future. I'll just stop there because I tried to summarize responses also to some of the questions on decentralization. Uh, Leo, can I intervene? Yeah, please, please, Afrin. Yeah. Um, 
I agree uh, that access to governance is, is a very key issue and that's why we are pushing decentralization and all that. But I, I feel that an overwhelming focus on that as a core problem uh, uh, sort of forces a bit of an error uh, in the way civil society acts. Uh, because uh, we tend to focus on the vertical axis between the citizen and the state. And then we try and act on that axis in more in smaller groups. And there's an asymmetry of power that the state always holds more power. So, so it really limits our, uh, uh, our capabilities. I think we de don't devote enough attention to the lateral connections between citizens, the horizontal axis. And uh, so we need more mobilization at that level in terms of articulating vision, uh, articulating possibilities, coming up with ward level, town plans, uh, whatever it is, th those kind of things and, and sort of demonstrate what is possible in an aspirational visionary sense, not just in a political self-interest sense. But, uh, so, so we need to look at our fellow citizens. And if we organize that, then acquire numbers coalescing around vision that then become large enough that they are more difficult to ignore. I just want to say, I think we are making progress in that direction, Prem. And that is one of the uh, things that has been delayed by at least two decades. And uh, if we were to even look at uh, the type of epochal events that we had uh, in post-independent India, if only J.C. Kumarappa had a say, then decentralization would, would be the method of governance and not in the verticals that were created, but diffusion of power across uh, layers of governance, which were far more accessible, which would have built a, a great difficulty for intransparency. Intransparency would have become extremely uh, difficult to get rooted in our system, but because verticals were, as you rightly say, Vertical government was created. We now have this situation where when we are challenged by climate change, it is a system, as uh, Ms. Sharma has rightly said, it is like written in stone. Uh, uh, so you need to break it. If you want to, as you say, radically transform and meet the challenges of the uh, 21st century, which is the most dominant of which will, I mean, it, it is humanity's gravest challenge. It is not the world's gravest, the planet's gravest challenge. Planet will manage without humanity. But how humanity braces itself and adjusts to live within this, the confines of this living planet, planetary system is the challenge, really. So what we did in this process was to try to, I mean, this was an idea that came from our colleagues. Uh, their average age is 26, 27. And we were thrilled when Bhargavi and I heard them talk about it. We were thrilled by the fact that they're actually thinking about the future in such, uh, such ways that requires all of us to bring diverse participants to it and address their futures. If they can't see a future beyond five years, I think that's a great failure on everyone's parts. And that's really a very dominant feature of their uh, sense of what is their future, right? So in that sense, this webinar series is really, and it's our request also to Ms. Sharma is that, can the government, you know, for instance, uh, C40 asked Bangalore to join, but so have we over decades, but our city did not respond to our call. But C40 is a global alliance. So there is a sense of the elite construction of corporate power. When it beckons, then our city responds. But should not the city also respond to the general ordinariness of the citizen's aspiration for a healthy and secure future? So to me, that is the real challenge. That it only responds to elitism, but it doesn't respond to the commonness of everyone's uh, concern and uh, hope. So, you know, this is a paradox we are living through. Uh, can I just come in here or uh, two points? Yes, yeah, sure, sure, Ms. Uh, yeah. Madeta. The first one was relating to the decentralization we were talking about. Um, so that's not the end all and the be all of the whole thing. That has a very critical role to play, and I thought of you know when you were talking, I was uh, what came to my mind was how many SDMCs are functioning in our state, and I thought I'll just share that very quickly. Many of you know about it also. Now SDMCs are um, subcommittees of the Gram Panchayats, School Development Monitoring Committees, which um, are in the 
I don't know about BBMP area, but the rest of the state, they are definitely functioning a little better. So they are they, they constituted of the parents of the children. And the secretary to the SDMC is the uh, school headmaster, headmistress, or the senior most teacher. So there, you know, a lot of that is uh, the micro level planning for the school, how the school has to function on a day to day basis and what kind of um, what processes are what that is where the local parents have to decide. And I think that can be also seen how it's been functioning because that is one area that is also a, a kind of a system that we should look at. That doesn't mean that at a macro level, you are just ignoring the whole thing. So that SDMC actually, by making the headmaster or headmistress as the secretary to that committee, we have a good interaction. So that is one, uh, just an example I wanted to give. And the other issue was regarding the C40, which Mr. Leo Saldana just mentioned. Yep. See, I, I, this is the first time I'm hearing about uh, what has been happening in BBMP over the last few years. And because I have not been working with, them, uh, with the urban development, but uh, it's, it's very important. I, I would not say that um, the subject of protecting our ecology or an environment is new to them because of the C40. That subject is not new and we all know that it's always been there and I don't have to defend them. Yes, it has gained visibility because of the C40 initiative, but subsequently also, I'm very sorry to say nothing has happened. So it's not that that elitist thing extracted a huge response from them. No. So in fact, I was very upset when I spoke to that. I'm sharing it today on a public platform, but I really don't want this to go out of our family. It's okay. That's how government, they have been very busy also. So I, I don't blame them uh, because too many things have been happening. Uh, yes, it gained a lot of visibility because of the C40, but there are things which have happened because I was taking stock of uh, some things which they have done over the last few years and all what are they doing. It's not a very cohesive and a well thought out plan which has happened. It's not like that. There is an awareness that we have a problem and we need to work towards the problem. And how that has to be done is something which need, needs to be suitably uh, devised and also worked out. In their own way, in their own haphazard way, they have also been doing. It's not that nothing has happened. They have been taking some small steps here and there and something has been worked out and they do have their own their own version of the action plan, which is actually right in front of me, but I don't want to share it here or say anything. Because there is an internal action plan which they have developed. But I do feel that a lot of improvement can come into it. A lot of change can come into it. Just like ESG is a good partner in this and has come out with very constructive and very thoughtful um, interventions. Similarly, we should do C40, just like that. It's nothing more, nothing less. And similarly, we, use, we need to talk to the other stakeholders. And I would like to use this opportunity um, to see that we, we involve the most important stakeholders in this, which is not, not C40 or not even the people, you and me, or these 40, 50 people who are sitting in this webinar. We really need to involve the public and work and let's use this opportunity. It could be your webinar. It could be the letter Manjunath Prasad wrote to C40. So it could be anything. It's on the same platform as I, as far as I'm concerned. It's, I really wouldn't call it um, a response because of that elitism. But let, anyway, that's, your, that's a way of looking at it. Any, any day well begun, let's begin. Let's begin. I said it in the beginning that I think we are too late. We're already very late. What we are doing should have been done long, long back. Probably it has been done. I don't know about it. It's possible because I, I really don't know about it because I can see whatever feedback I got today because I, before coming for this seminar, I wanted to ask them. I asked Sarfaraz also. I spoke with him also and a couple of other people, what all you have done and what's happening. So it's not that they haven't done. This needs much more thinking. This needs to be developed in a much more cohesive manner so that um, it, it, is, it is a fruitful exercise, you know, and also brings out a very equitable kind of a, uh, action plan. We need to look at that. 
and anyway i'm glad that we are talking and we are working on this look at a brighter uh, way forward thank you thank you uh, ms sharma there is a question from katyaini and after that i do see two uh, hands that are raised i'll come to you all uh, but before that katyaini's question is how does one reconcile uh, your view that localizing climate change is necessary with the fact that ward committees have been made advisory bodies and area sabha representatives are made non voting members of ward committees in the new bbmp bill and the fact that the ward committees have been kept dysfunctional and the area sabhas have not been notified at all so she has a little addition to that and that is uh, how does one accept the inequality that has been created between citizens of small cities under the municipalities act and the citizens of big cities under the kmc act i think both prem um, leo and ms sharma can answer that prem um as far as i am aware the area sabha although it's recognized as a sort of basic building block uh, does not find statutory recognition in the system in karnataka uh, in ba in bangalore um so I, i think that's been part of a problem and and it's tied into this larger problem of ward committees themselves being uh, largely dysfunctional so uh So I think it uh, needs to. Uh, I mean, all of that needs to change, and it's only going to change from a popular movement. Uh, unless, unless, uh, I mean, I think a key problem is that many ordinary citizens are not aware of the seventy fourth amendment, not aware of the intent of decentralization, not aware of the possibilities of things like area sabhas and uh, uh, ward committees. And as Leo pointed out, there is a thirst for engagement. So. so i think that can be used to build up a popular movement uh regarding the imbalance between um, small towns and big metropolitan cities uh, i think we we don't have an uh, one of the things besides having uh, sort of plans for all cities there needs to be a, a, a sort of regional plan which looks at the structures of cities across the region and and cities are distributed in a hierarchy that's a, that's a well recognized fact in geography uh, in so so actually you can scale your investment uh, you know you don't need to build a tertiary uh, care hospital in every every settlement you can actually distribute them so so what you tend to have is you have a metropolis and there might be six tier two cities depending on the metro metropolis and within those each of those tier 2 has a set of smaller towns dependent on it and then and it goes down all the way to uh, uh, the individual village and and we got to recognize again the network complexity of that and and tie into the logic of the network for our investment actually my undergraduate thesis was on this and i found that there was a document produced by the government of karnataka in the mid 1970s which actually had mapped every every urban settlement in the state on this hierarchy and what investment came at which level but we have not uh, recognized that i mean i think the document is just sitting on a shelf somewhere so uh, so, so we need effective regional planning besides effective uh, urban planning yeah thank you prem uh, ms sharma then ms uh, uh, leo you all have anything ms. more sharma, to add? just want to clarify one thing as uh, prem that uh, the area sabhas are a statutory requirement but just like ward committees were not made operational the area sabhas are also not operational ward committee became operational because as an outcome of the 2018 judgment of the karnataka high court in dst's case uh, we would hope that uh, the state legislature has already expressed the bureaucracy will now say area sabhas must be functional everywhere it doesn't require a judicial directive at all i'll stop there mr sharma I I just have to say yes I agree <laughs> it has to be done I have no other view on this and I'm all for decentralization and empowerment of the decentralized uh, bodies which we have proposed definitely it has see we have done much better in the rural areas in the urban areas especially in Bangalore we have really not been able to and it is not good we are seeing the results of that okay? we are seeing it. so and we have also seen some results of, in a positive manner in the rural areas of the decentralization and the empowerment of those organizations which have happened and uh, uh, i i i'm with uh, everyone in this the 
because this has to be done but it's not in my hands alone <laughs> it has to be done we have we, we are always pushing for it in our internal meetings we always push for this you know definitely we'll take it forward please kindly recommend us in your action plan also yeah we'll take it forward thank you thank you so we have uh, uh, two raised hands uh, dr nagendran uh, we would welcome you to share your thoughts yeah uh, good evening to all uh, leo if you remember i have missed only one of uh, your no series one day one day one day i was in some other meeting i've been following you know whatever uh, you have been deliberating for the last eight weeks and uh, the action plan that uh, you are proposing and when you are coming out with it's all fine but uh, i i would like to just make you know three or maybe four points number one is we when you talk about decentralized governance yes a centralized plan can never become decentralized execution so instead of telling that what we have is centralized what we have is vertical hierarchy what we have is you know need for repeated intervention by judiciary and so on if we can impress upon the planners and also as you are doing if the planning process changes in such a way that whether the government likes it or not to execute that plan if they have to involve the grassroots person until the top most person so this uh, so called decentralization need not be you know talked about like an election hearing in you know, a campaign and automatically it will come and uh, the, the, i think you know uh, you should try to do this uh, as uh, you know uh, uh, ms sharma was telling the government has its own functioning uh, template and we should not uh, try to change the template but we should see how our planning makes the template flexible on its own and then you get the result and then you were talking about lawrence fernandez i want you to come to chennai leo and uh, see how mr mas subramaniam worked earlier he was he was the mayor of chennai and during our sida project for 9 years on asia regional project on environmental technology he used to be with me on kodingayur dump site for the whole day i mean i used to spend four days in a week in the dump site with the people there because you know we were doing a project to relay the road map for the entire asia not just chennai not just india and you know if the public and if the people who are involved in this process are convinced that there is real good intention to deliver i think automatically the planning process would come and uh, though very nice stories you no know, i i heard today from mr prem i mean that he was talking about 1920 i'm very sorry to be uh, i mean uh, be very frank on this all this you know cast and dot and this you know i think i think they have no role to play now at all you know leo to which class i belong i used to spend you know 90% of my time with people who work on solid waste management in chennai city and now you must come to chennai and see how solid waste management is being done and how all the people the, the mla the ministers right and then including ias officers how they involve themselves in creating a cleaner chennai and you know uh, if this attitude is brought in then all the things that we are talking about as individual actors will automatically fall in place and you will get and then regarding this judicial intervention you were telling me that you had a meeting with uh, the person concerned uh, mr uh, mr sarfraz i mean i i forget the name i'm sorry and you said lot of things were solved 
Well, why don't you take that as a model and say, nothing? we had problem in this aspect. Because of the directive of the court, we had this meeting and these were solved. Meet all the concerned IAS officers or concerned people in governance and get to uh, work. Because courts are so very overloaded that no, it may not be possible for every time to go to court and get direction from the court. And especially you know, now, courts are doing a lot of work, you know that. And I sent you, Leo, one uh, paper cutting a couple of days ago. Uh, Justice Ramakrishnan has told, I will jail Telangana's chief secretary if he doesn't do what we have asked him to do. I mean, to this extent, judiciary is cooperating. But you know, this should not be taken too far. right? And involving people, involving people, make so-and-so a committee member. Yeah, if you make the plan in such a way that he should be there, he will be there. Right? And then, especially this climate change, the, the problem is created by the decentralized system. That means, you know, by, by this, what I mean is, everyone in the society contributes his or her might to the problem. And so this is an excellent opportunity to involve everyone and make this decentralization change work when we talk about climate action plan. So, I mean, th th these are the three things that I just wanted to uh, tell. Thank you, Thanks, Leo. Good. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Nagendra. Uh, Mr. Vasant Kumar, uh, you would like to hear your thoughts. Uh, it's, it's already 8 o'clock, almost 8 o'clock, so let's all be very brief as uh, time is running out. Yeah. Kelsa Taman? Ha, Kelsa, Haley. Kanadal Matar Boda? Ha, Matar Boda. Vandita Madam Martagata? Kanadal Matar Dartagata? Mubatai Varshagi, the Karnataka Bandu. Nam Kelsa, Nam Kelsa, full Kanad the Lay Rate. Now Bariu do, Odo do, Matado do Ella, Kanad the Lay. Mato Shatai. Matadi, now Matadi, David Namia, Kanada and Marto Tide. Namia, more questions today. Bala, brief on the day, Bari Vagle, Barney could put it there. One the work, work committee Bageta were there. Yes, DM Kaltara go get there. SDM and a chairman, a president, a Yarnum Marbudu, the corporate row, headmaster, we will let's say Kundu Martha. And the Hagatra, if the P1 is has a child studying in the school, he can become the president. That is exactly what's happening. Adetara, Adetara. So the headmaster in Altaro, corporate in Altaro, or president Kelbaka. What kind of a Kelterema? No, no, practically Athra Irbodu, but Athra system Marilla now. System Malada, none about the system, how malleable it can be. Because I am also a central government officer, 40 years service. I do. Then we have to change human nature. Then we just have to change human nature. Adwandama, I do. Anyway, Adana Sulpa strength of Marabaka. Because the bottom up is a model of the top down, the The last man never gets the benefit, even though he is a strong stakeholder. This is the failure of the system of the strength of the public administration. It is a church upon the two, you are hacked around the one out and a tapas like Nadala Yen Marbo do, and now on the Adrusti Conan in the way to Adene Adenes and Nanetardo. Adenes and Nanetardo, they get a world committee in nominations, Madabe Kadre, responsible people Namadi. Bear a church in a Madua, Adrupake, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I the transport sector is the worst possible enemy of climate change. And uh, here my suggestion is private IE electric vehicles, the public transport system with our government, if it can give us give them incentives, will it not bring down the carbon spewing on the Third one, last world level. Power karmic, the, the solid waste management, 
I was a member of the Vision Committee of Solid Waste Management, and I have already given my then BBMP ko kals kotti the. That was ten years ago. Adrani power ka na ward na nimma horusu na na mane munde ekhe ano questiono na okel tai thevi. Iba ka ilinda thavondogi yellow land fill ga ki alli ka kasta kordo kordo badli. Dai me to ward level lal le ne in ward office idia la adu vallga le ne ne. ಆ ವಾರ್ಡ್ದು ಕೊಳಕನ್ನ ತಗೊಂಡ್ಬಂದ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಅಲ್ಲೇನೆ ಸಂಸ್ಕರಣೆ ಮಾಡಿ ದಯವಿಟ್ಟು ಅಲ್ಲಿಂದ ಬರೋ ಮೆನ್ಯೂರ್ನ ಆ ಪೌರ ಕಾರ್ಮಿಕರುಗಳಿಗೆ ಕೊಟ್ಟುಬಿಟ್ಟು ತಗೊಂಡು ಹೋಗಿ ಮನೆಗಳಿಗೆ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಲಿ ಒಂದೊಂದು ಕೆ ಜಿ ತಗೊಂಡೋಗಿ ಐದೈದು ರೂಪಾಯಿ ಮಾರ್ಲಿ ಮಾ ಯಾಕೆಂದ್ರೆ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಬೆಂಗ್ಳೂರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ವಿ ವಿ ಆರ್ ವೆರಿ ಫಾಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಎನ್ವೈರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಎಲ್ಲೋ ಒಂದ್ ಕಡೆ ಪಾಟ್ಗಳನ್ನ ಇಟ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ವಿ Arghavi. Yeah, uh, 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 thank you, Mr. Um, Vasant. Um, um, much of the suggestions you are giving has already been a, a part of the orders that the High Court has issued. Uh, we would encourage you to go through many of the interim orders and the final orders and uh, the case is also ongoing. So if you follow the PIL, um, you can see what is happening there. All these suggestions are already there. There's just one question we missed out and I would also encourage uh, my colleagues, Sana, Malvika, Shreshta, Kartik, Ashwin, Satvika, uh, who've been key to this entire um, series. If you all have to share anything, if you want to ask a question, if you want to comment, please go ahead, uh, think about it. Uh, I'll come back to you in a minute. We have one question from Shivani Thakur, who says, would like to know more about uh, how to push plans for behavioral change. That is a challenge that we are all working on. And even this effort is part of that, although it, it, it is a challenge that, you know, it doesn't reach everybody. Uh, so while we address that, I would encourage all of you to uh, speak as well. ಪ್ರೇಮ್ ಮಿಸ್ ಶರ್ಮಾ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ದಟ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಆನ್ ಹೌ ಟು ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಬಿಹೇವಿಯರಲ್ ಚೇಂಜ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಐ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಸ್ಪೋಕ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಸೆಟ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ದ ಜಾಯ್ ಆಫ್ ಏಜೆನ್ಸಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಟೋನಮಿ ಅಂಡ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ನಾಟ್ ಟು ಗೆಟ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಗೆಟ್ ಬಿಹೇವಿಯರ್ ಚೇಂಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ಗಾಟ್ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ದಮ್ ದ ಫೀಡ್ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಲೂಪ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಇಂಪ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದೇ ಬಿಹೇವಿಯರ್ ರಾಪಿಡ್ ಫೀಡ್ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಲೂಪ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಆನ್ಯುಯಲ್ ಸರ್ವೇ ಆರ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಕ್ ದಟ್ uh if i can uh, just address the question that came up about electric electric vehicles and uh, use that as an example to say how we need to think of the systemic behavior and not not isolated solutions uh for example uh, what uh, dry, driving a policy encouraging electric vehicles what will be the impact on the demand for power generation and what, what will be the carbon footprint of the response to that increased demand you have to you have to bring that into the system also and and you have to look at overall goals which is actually how to minimize movement not to uh, make uh, uh, transit more efficient so uh, as an example of this the us uh, uh, some decades ago pushed uh, legislation to enforce fuel efficiency uh, because uh, this was this came out of the you know Uh, the the petrol sho- the shocks to the uh, petrol system during the, the 1970s and and uh, they found that instead of decreasing fuel efficiency it actually increased in fuel consumption it actually increased it because people felt with fuel efficient cars felt less guilty about driving and actually started driving more so so you got to look at these wider questions on how one minimizes movement how you look at land use patterns self sufficient neighborhoods uh, all all these kind of things to to actually uh, look at it from a systemic perspective we we can't we can't isolate problems because the problem with isolating problems is we relocate them it's like flyover solve one spot of congestion but they push the congestion to another spot so so we we have the, that's why this importance of systemic understanding thank you uh, thank you prem uh, shreshta did i see your hand go up do you want to say something or malvika sana ashwin kartik anybody okay uh 
So I think we've covered all the questions. Sorry, that sorry. sorry. Yeah, I have some sir. activity issues. So uh, I was wondering whether we should take up the issue of water privatization at this point and discuss something about how we can uh, ensure a right to access of water under the situation when uh, water privatization is uh, moving on rampantly in the city and groundwater is almost off. So uh, if anybody could uh, come in and speak how we can deal with the problem of water privatization, but also ensure access to water equitably to the uh, areas that do not have pipe water access, then it would be uh, helpful. That's all. Any of the speakers want to address that? Take that. What we could do is we could have a separate session on that. It's a topic by itself. Uh, I know that uh, Ms. Sharma has to attend. There are people waiting for her in another Zoom conference. So she's delayed that because I promised her we'll wrap up. Okay, okay. So I, th I think uh, we've come to the last of the questions, but there's been a series of comments and uh, other uh, suggestions as well, uh, which is very interesting. But due to lack of time, we will not read them, but I'm sure all of you would have read. I now request Leo to uh kind of uh you know say thanks to everybody and also wrap up this entire series with his own thoughts and everything that's been happening in the court outside these dialogues the many experiences and everything so that we can go forward from here yeah okay i mean i was hoping shrestha would do that but i don't mind doing it uh, i just want to say that this is a process which i think uh, we tested uh, in the most restrictive of formats, which is Zoom. As much as we see each other and feel like we are sitting in the same room, it is not the reality. And I'm sure that the quality of our uh, 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 interventions would have been perhaps different, in my view, much richer, where we actually part of a process where we went over eight weeks to different parts of the city and held it in uh, sort of town hall settings. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, experiences that I uh, feel which is very rich in my life is when Mr. Jairam Ramesh held the public uh, consultations on evolving uh, the green mission plan on uh, the coastal regulations on notification, most importantly, the BT Brinjal issue. Uh, and I recall when he held the Bangalore meeting, uh, the former Prime Minister of India, uh, Mr. Deve Goda, came just as an ordinary person to participate. And that is the quality of politics that we need. That even though you're former prime minister, you don't have airs about coming and sitting uh, in a, along with local you know, people from across the state and participating in constructing the future uh, uh, as a people's process. You are Anant Murthy, who's no more with us, uh, was there. He just came. Uh, so you know, it's that qualitative difference of conversation that makes the future uh, better. Uh, as long as we do not get to that point, uh, I think like I, I fully uh, echo Crane's concern that we're just going to talk at each other. We're not really dealing with the problem. So this was an effort to try and, despite the constraints of a virus uh, uh, coming in the way of humanity and its ways, uh, our messy there, but it was still functional and made us totally dis dysfunctional. We said, how can we intelligently continue this conversation? So we hope that we have brought in a higher level of intelligence to this conversation than just the ordinariness of, you know, there is air, it is polluted, let's fix it. There is noise that is, uh, you know, uh, spoiling our uh, ambient environment. Let's go do something or the waste is falling here and there. You know, we want to get out of this uh, sense of uh, the what is visible to encompass what we do not see, but is also a serious problem. The virus we didn't see and see what a fundamental difference it has made to our living and uh, to so many people who are not with us now. Uh, so I think it is really that. And, uh, and in some ways, I want to go back to the uh, example that Prem gave of Kaban Park. All the time, you want to do something. So in the text that has evolved, which is in a participatory way, we have had 41 speakers or 800 participants. But the text that has evolved is rich in the sense that while it is trying to make a shift for the better, it is also acknowledging the importance of uh, having memories of the place. Uh, sameness should not be the problem. Uh, and we should be enriched by the multiple narratives of that sameness. So if Kaban Park 
is the same way as it was 50 years ago, there should not be a problem because there are different narratives of Kaban Park. Uh, so the question is, how do you make it accessible? How do you, so I'm using Kaban Park as a metaphor for the entire state. How do you make the entire state accessible in an equitable sense? At the same time, two generations down the line, if people look back and said, there was this process and uh, this process became epidemic. That's our hope. If this process can become epidemic, not the virus, uh, then I think transformation follows. So it is in that sense uh, of imaginary that uh, we took up this uh, idea that our colleagues put together and uh, we ran with it. And we were so, so happy that so many people from different uh, sectors of the government, uh, corporate sector, the uh, civil society, academia, um, uh, people representing trade unions, workers from the field, uh, uh, street vendors, just about everybody, when we asked them, they were readily uh, engaged farmers. Uh, so the idea was to actually show that complexity is this. And that from this complexity, we actually have to hope a better future can be made possible by constructing visions which are achievable at the same time, fantastic. Uh, so that's broadly what uh, this was about. And uh, I really thank uh, uh, Ms. Sharma for making time uh, and Prem for really applying his mind to the eight webinars that took place. It is not at all comprehensive. It is indicative of what should happen through a ground of process, every ward should have such debates and every ward should construct this plan. But at the same time, every agency of the state should sort of walk out of offices and mingle with people and their ideas and uh, help build an overarching framework uh, so that Bangalore can make a difference for India. Uh, so thank you all. And thank you, Bhargavi, for uh, holding it all together today. Uh, and I particularly thank each one of my colleagues. And uh, again, thank thank you all for uh, thank the participants particularly for staying on and enriching this process with their comments, criticisms. Uh, lots of people have also written to us uh, by email. We we'll build it all together and we present it to the government uh, by the fifth of July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Have a good week.